I'm Vanessa, the associate editor at Book Riot, and if you have been paying any attention to the bookish internet at all, then you don't have to be told, but we are living in adaptation nation right now. It seems like every day there is at least one, if not 10 pieces of adaptation news, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, etc., that is being adapted either as a film, as a series, it's just, it's everywhere. People have their feelings about that, which is something I'm very aware of given the fact that I moderate social media for Book Riot and so I'm seeing people's reactions to this sort of stuff all the time. So between that experience and a recent bonus episode of the Book Riot podcast that focused on a particular adaptation that I'll be talking about in a bit, I just have come to the realization that I kind of love bad adaptations. <laughs> so I thought I would go over three of those with you today poke a little bit of fun at it maybe, but to explain also why I'm super into most adaptations. So the 30 that I have a lot of love for that people are like, really? <laughs> One, Harry Potter, in general, you know, of all the eight films, people have a lot of feelings about all or one or more of the films, and with good reason. To this day, I cannot get over the fact they didn't give Lily Potter green eyes when she was a little girl in that last film. Like what? Lily Potter's eyes were green. That's why Harry Potter's eyes were green. They talk about it all the time from the first book to the last. Like couldn't you put some contacts on the girl or like CGI? Overall though, I do just really enjoy them. They're a fun thing that I like spending time with. But the film that a lot of people have feelings about that I kind of dig is the third one based on the third book, of course. That's Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. It is markedly different than the first two. So if you were attached in any way to the decidedly kind of happier, glowier, cutesier, still I think targeted at a younger audience, tone of the first two books and or films, then that third film was probably a bit of a shock. <laughs> but as I learned on the Warner Brothers studio tour <laughs> when I lived in England for a while and did all things geekishly Potter, the thing that the shift, the difference in theme that you notice is very, very deliberate. They brought in a director whose job it was to take the books or the, the film and just completely shift the tone to accommodate the like darker plot points that were slowly but surely making their way in. You know, yeah, the, right around the third book, stuff starts to get a little more real. Alfonso Cuaron was brought in to do it, which, hey, brown man directing. But yeah, I think he kind of accomplished that mission. He definitely took the theme of the books and movies and just in that third one was like, follow me to the dark place. Everything about the film, from the way it's shot, the, the music, the background, the like kind of color wash, it's a little bit kind of gloomy, murky the entire time. Everything about it is different, but again, it's deliberate. So I think it did what it set out to do. And overall, yeah, it's funky, it's different, but I kind of dig it. The second adaptation that people were like, girl, who, what, <laughs> that I just really love. <laughs> and is actually the whole reason that this post came to be, or this video, is my love for The Da Vinci Code. So The Da Vinci Code was, as I mentioned, recently discussed in that bonus episode of the Book Riot podcast. Jeff and Rebecca did a rewatch. I knew that they were doing this and I saw Rebecca rewatching it as she posted on like her Instagram story. So I actually went and rewatched it the same day. <laughs> and while the general consensus among both of them and really people in general is that it's so, so bad, I so, so don't care. <laughs> I love the whole like Robert Langdon series. Uh, the books we, lots of us at Book Riot, love. It's unabashed, unapologetic. I won't even call it a guilty pleasure because there is zero guilt. Nada. Me gusta. But the films, a lot of people are like, yes, so listen. Whereas I'm just like, yeah, give it to me. I love them. I just think they're fun. I, I think overall that it's one of the themes that links my taste for most adaptations. It's just that they're, they're fun for me. They're an, an outlet of escape. I don't go into them necessarily expecting to be profoundly moved and changed. That is the case with some adaptations. But a lot of the ones that I choose to spend the most time with are just ones that are adaptations of things that I just find intensely like likable, even if they're not highbrow. And so I kind of don't mind if they're a little cheesy corny. Yeah, Tom Hanks probably isn't the best choice for that like Robert Langdon swag. And maybe I'm giving him too much credit because I think he's just a cool dude in general. But 
yeah, I really enjoy them. I definitely watched the crap out of Angels and Demons too. I will be watching Inferno probably tonight. <laughs> I just think they're enjoyable and they're, I know what I'm getting when I sign up for this stuff and I tend to get exactly what that is. So yeah, I don't mind. And the third adaptation that I really like that most people were like sending me text messages and calling me to check up on me because it is based on an author that I love, one who occupies like two and a half shelves on my bookcase. And that is Agatha Christie, specifically the most recent adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express, the one that starred everybody really, Kenneth Branagh as Detective Poirot, Michelle Pfeiffer's in it, Penelope Cruz, Johnny Depp, whatever. <laughs> but I get why people have their feelings there are parts of it that could have been done better. I did not appreciate, and, and if I'm just like off base here and my memory doesn't serve me right, feel free to correct me. I have read all of Agatha Christie's works. It's been a while since I've reread some of them, like a while, but I don't ever remember there being a point at which Poirot's kind of fastidious quirkiness was ever described as being the result of a woman who changed him forever because she broke his heart. And I don't even remember in the film whether it's that it's somebody who broke his heart or if it's someone that passed, but there is that scene, spoiler kind of, not really, in the end where you see it, or find out that a lot of why Poirot is the way that he is is because he, there's like a broken heart situation. And that I was like, no, Poirot was just fastidious and kind of annoying because he just was. Sometimes I'm annoying, it has nothing to do with the guy. It's just who we are. <laughs> so other than that though, Again, I kind of knew what I was sort of getting. And then, as I've mentioned, I think a couple times now, I just have such appreciation for some of these particular works or things that I love that I just want more of it. And I'm okay with someone else's interpretation of it, even if it isn't 100% what I would have interpreted it as visually or otherwise. I have a lot of respect for people in the visual arts because I don't know how you take a work that is either you know, again, like a lofty piece of literary fiction or a piece of sci-fi or fantasy or magical realism or the visual details that are described are, I think, going to be challenging to actually put into a visual medium. Or if it's just like a Harry Potter or another series that is so beloved that the bar is already impossibly high. I think it takes a lot of mm, to look at that and go, yeah, I'm going to put that on, you know, the big or small screen. I'm going to rock it like I could never. So go for you. And I I think maybe that's why I give a lot of this stuff some extra room. Now, I do draw the line at stuff that is either offensive, harmful in any way. And there are some adaptations that truly are just that bad. There are a few. I didn't want to be a mean girl, so I'm not going to talk about those today. But I say 95% of the time I am going to be interested and <laughs> probably appreciative of an adaptation. Just because again, I I want to spend more time in the things that I love and if that means seeing it in film, even if it doesn't 100% hit the mark, I'm okay with that. So yeah, that's just my little corner of the adaptation world. Please tell me if you have adaptations that you love in spite of the fact that everybody else is like, whoa. <laughs> so again, at the end of the day, I'm always going to be a proponent of just loving the things that you love as long as they're not harming anybody in any way. But I want to know what yours are because now I'm just really curious. Thanks for watching. See you next week.